you're very welcome to our YPN session um, on access to COVID-19 vaccines. My name is Dara Moyarty. I work in communications and research here at the Institute. I'm delighted to be chairing this session this afternoon. Um, we have two distinguished very speakers with us, uh, Manon Elbury, MEP, and Jim Clarkin of Oxfam. I'm going to introduce both of them in a moment. Um, I suppose the topic at hand today is, is, is very, very pressing across the Western industrialized world. Uh, we continue to widely vaccinate our populations, the young and old, uh, the sick and the healthy. Um, there's a menu of options available for us, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca or Janssen. Um, there's, there's all manner of vaccines available to us in the West. Um, full disclosure, I myself am 26 and healthy, no underlying conditions, and I walked into my local pharmacy on Tuesday and got my vaccine. Um, all the while, hundreds of millions of people across the world um, are nowhere near getting their COVID-19 vaccine, very vulnerable and very sick people. Um, as the WHO has repeatedly warned, we are on course to create a two-track pandemic. We already have created one, in fact, and uh, richer countries are on one side and poorer countries are on, on the other. Um, delighted today to welcome two speakers who are going to share their thoughts on this very important topic. Um, let me first introduce Manon Aubry. Um, Manon is a French MEP representing La France and Soumy following her election in May 2019. Uh, she currently serves as co-leader of the uh, European United Left, Nordic Green Left Group in the European Parliament, GUE NGL, and she's a member of the European Parliament's Legal Affairs Committee and its subcommittee on tax. Uh, she previously worked for Oxfam France, and she also lectured in human rights at Saint Po. Uh, Tim Clarkin uh, is CEO of Oxfam Ireland, and he's also an executive director of Oxfam International. He's been a founding member of the People's Vaccine Alliance, Stop Climate Chaos, and the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights, uh, as well as the Irish Refugee and Migration Coalition. He's also a former chair of DOCUS. He's an adjunct professor in the School of Business and Law at UCC, a board member of Cork University Business School, and a regular contributor to uh, several university programs. Delighted today to be joined by both of them. Uh, thanks again to the pair of you for taking your time this evening to be with us. Uh, just in terms of format for our audience, uh, each speaker is going to give us an initial five minutes or so of, of introduction, uh, setting the scene of what they think Europe is doing in, in, in the area of access to COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we would like to hear from you, so please do submit your questions throughout the session using the Zoom Q&A function. You can also get involved in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and hashtag YPN. Uh, Manon, I'll go to you first. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks for the invitation and, and thanks for bringing up the issue because I have to say, and I'm sure Jim will agree with me, for, for a long period of time, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we felt a little bit on our own trying to bring up the issue of TRIPS waiver. And there were only a couple of uh, NGOs and a couple of policymakers bring, bringing, bringing in the issue. And, you know, from the beginning, there was just like, okay, you know, this race to get the vaccines uh, but at the end, the race was just somehow the end, you know, we, we find the vaccines and then we, we don't question the way we actually distribute it and the capacity to ensure that everyone around the world uh, will have access to vaccines. And a year later, or a year and a half later, you know, we thought that we were close to getting out of the crisis, but every time the... The, 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 the virus is coming back like a boomer. And the reason why it's coming back, and you know, we started to have the, the Indian um, uh, variant and then the Southern African variant, etc. And we can go all around the world. And now we even stop calling them by their countries, which I think is a good idea because we shouldn't blame them. The ones that we should blame are actually the pharmaceutical companies that um, you know, keep uh, the monopoly over uh, the production of the vaccines and the immediate results, obviously, is that there aren't enough vaccines for everyone around the world. So of course, we, and I think there's an economic argument there, but the first and foremost argument for a TRIPS waiver is just efficiency. If we do not vaccine the entire world, more or less at the same time or within a short period of time, then the, the, we all know already that the virus is gonna evolve and maybe it's not gonna be resistant to, to the vaccine by the way. 
and then the, the virus is going to keep spreading with all the, of the consequences that we know on our daily life. So for me, there's a first argument, which is just like a, a medical argument. And this is why, by the way, you, the WHO and a lot of scientists have been pushing for a TRIPS waiver. Because if those pharmaceutical companies are keeping the monopoly over the production of vaccines, well, then for sure, we don't use all of the capacities that we have around the world, and we don't produce enough vaccines for everyone. And especially the ones who don't have access to vaccines, we all know they're mostly in poor countries. Um, uh, I don't have the latest data in mind, but I'm sure uh, Jim has it uh, in terms of the percentage of the vaccines that have been produced going to um, to the, 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 the richest countries versus uh, the, the production uh, going to, to poor uh, countries. Uh, we know there's like barely maybe 1% of African that have been uh, vaccinated uh, and we can compare it to the 50% uh, of Americans or close to 40% now of uh, Europeans and that race is only it's always rich countries winning it and the second issue I would I would like to touch upon in, in this introduction is obviously the economic issue as long as those pharmaceutical companies keep the monopoly over the production well they also keep the choice of the price uh, that they're producing it because everyone every country desperately needs access to vaccines. And as a result, well, we've seen already Pfizer increasing the price of their vaccine from 12 to 90 euros the dose and, and even more in the latest contract with the European Union, this, which is by the way an issue because as European member of the European, as member of the European Parliament, we don't even have access uh, to the full contract that we're signing. And we should remember to those who think that um, uh, to those who think that, you know, it's just like a, a, a sort of a, a fair return to, to those companies that have been investing money. It's true that they've been investing money, but one should remember that all of those vaccines have been paid with public money, your money, my money, state's money. And it's therefore fair to say, well, since it's been paid by public money, this should be a public good. And that's why uh, this, this vaccine should be made a public good and trips should be waived. And it's not normal to make profits over the pandemic. And that's why we've been you know, supporting the campaign at European level, supporting the NGOs, supporting as well the petition at European level. And when I see that you know, the CEO of Moderna, for example, uh, the CEO being French, Moderna being one of the uh, leading uh, big pharma companies, when I see that now is one of the richest persons in the world, and at the same time, millions of people who still don't have access to vaccines, I think there's a big issue there. So, and, and I'm not even talking about all of the other uh, pharmaceutical companies that uh, increased a lot their profits. Um, uh, uh, for Pfizer only, uh, this is more than 3 billion. Uh, of euros and of course uh, a big part of a big chunk of this money just going to the pockets of the shareholders of those companies but so i think these two these two issues are the two main arguments why we're fighting through trips for waiver for a long period of time we've been fighting a little bit on our own trying to bring up the issue in the european parliament i've been asking on behalf of my group the left group in the parliament for more than 10 times this issue uh, to be voted uh, in the parliament. And eventually, um, a bit more than a month ago, we managed to have an official position of the European Parliament calling <clears throat> the European Commission for, uh, to, 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 for TRIPS waiver. And fortunately, we know that the European Commission is, is rather following the position of the European Council and EU member states. And we know that they haven't been that progressive in the negotiation uh, in the World Trade Organization that uh, Jim, Jim might like to, to touch upon. I'm gonna stop there to respect uh, the time and I'm happy to answer uh, any question because I have a lot to say based on this. 
Uh, brilliant, Manon. Thanks very much for, for that initial introduction. Um, Jim, I'll go to you next. And and, and again, just, you know, uh, five, seven minutes would be great. And then we get straight into the discussion. And, and I already see a couple of questions coming in. So please do fire any questions and we look forward to taking them once Jim is finished. Thanks very much. Go on ahead, Jim. Great, Dara. And uh, thanks very much. And thanks, Manon, as well. And I'm going to compliment a lot of what Manon has said. I suppose, first of all, you know, we're all delighted and amazed at the, the pace at which vaccines were created. Uh, it's a scientific, uh, extraordinary breakthrough. Um, and I think in this part of the world, we're, we're almost getting a sense that somehow we're reaching the end of the pandemic. It's kind of coming to that point, opening up and all the other kind of things, but it's nowhere near the truth. I mean, the, there are about 100,000 people dying of COVID-19 every week in countries that don't have access to vaccines. Just 0.2% of vaccines have been distributed to low income countries. And we're saying that nine out of 10 people in those countries will not be vaccinated this year. In fact, the economics, Economist Intelligence Unit estimates that it'll be 2023, 2024, before there's mass immunization of the global population. Um, and then if you compare that with this part of the world that has, has bought up uh, more vaccines than it could possibly use or need, um, you know, there's, it's stark, the level of inequality that has that has arisen from this and what it has done, both from a global north south point of view and also within countries, it's it's exacerbated kind of very stark inequalities that have already existed, particularly health inequalities and income inequalities and so on. Um, and, you, you know, and what Man Manon's point about, you know, even from a self interest perspective, you know, if we allow um, this pandemic to continue, variants will continue to, to progress and develop. And unless we get our hands around this thing and, and, and properly vaccinate the world's population, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, the, the, there's a, even the economic argument. I mean, we, the International Chamber of Commerce has reported that uh, best case scenario, that if, if this part of the world is fully vaccinated over the, over the course of this year, the economic loss because of poor countries uh, being impacted will be about nine trillion dollars, which will also affect this part of the world. So it's it's a you know that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is because it's a justice issue, it's a fairness issue, it's an equality issue. But even from a self interest perspective, it makes no sense not to vaccinate the world. The bottom line here is we just don't have enough vaccines. That's it. And I mean you know we you know we're now seeing a third wave hitting African countries. Uh, you know, we work in many, as you know, developing countries across the world. In Yemen, where there's a conflict over the last seven years, um, only 10 to 20 percent of health systems, which were basic enough to begin with, are actually functioning. And now they're being completely overwhelmed by this. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem in the global south and it's not going to go away and it's going to affect everybody. Just in specifically in relation to the EU's response, um, you know, they're, they're, they're talking about donating vaccines to COVAX and so on. You know, the bottom line is is we need justice, not charity. It's not crumbs from the table. Whatever whatever we're le whatever's left over after we're done with it, we we'll give to those people over there. It's 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 a highly disrespectful and and damaging and 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 wrong. And um, ultimately, the the trips waiver it, from from our perspective is the only way that we can resolve this. It's the only way to to ratchet up, scale up uh, production at, a, at at mass scale, which is what's required. Uh, the, the five or six companies that currently produce the vaccine don't have enough capacity. They're not sharing it with others. As Manon rightly said, this, um, this capacity and uh, in intellectual property was developed largely on the back of public money. So it has to be a public good. You know, you know there is, there's a counter argument about you know, pharmaceutical companies investing so much of their own money and so on. And look, there is a, there's a wider question about how we develop drugs, period. How, how do we develop drugs for, for public good into the future and not you know, unfairly putting all of the burden and risk on pharmaceuticals? But in this instance, that was not the case. The, 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 the burden and risk was taken by the public purse, by all of us. Uh, and as a result, the, the, res the, the outcome should be shared by all of us. And it's not like these pharma companies are not going to make enormous profits. As Manon said, look, one of the one of the leaders is one of the richest people in the world and they, we, we've seen and, and this will go on for years so they, they will make dramatic profits but they don't have to do it at the cost of millions of lives and livelihoods across the world so this is you know this is the argument for it it has been you know the, the European Union's position has been 
very disappointing and very disappointing very disappointing that Ireland has stuck with that line. We've seen uh, member legislatures in France and Spain and Italy who are vocal in supporting the the, tri the trips waiver. Um, it's it's been uh, progressed by uh, South Africa and India. There are over 100 countries who are supporting it now, including the US, which one ordinarily you wouldn't have expected. You would expect Europe to be a bit more progressive. Um, but still, Ireland and the EU are holding their holding their ground. And you know the the kind of arguments that they're putting forward um, for this are spurious, and and you could drive a train through them. To be perfectly honest, I mean this idea that um, that pharmaceutical companies won't keep innovating, you know, or that the trips waiver will somehow end the end the way we we develop medication. Well, there's a question about whether that should happen or not. But second of all. This is a once in a in a not in a lifetime once in a hundred years event, um, and there is precedence, by the way. I mean, the the HIV/AIDS um, global crisis uh, was brought under control, and you know it's still a, it's still a big issue in many countries. But it was brought under control because the intellectual property for the ARVs was shared with manufacturing companies in developing countries, who were then able to produce drugs that were affordable to people. Uh, you know, we lost many, many years and many, many lives uh, from HIV and AIDS uh, because those companies didn't do that fast enough. There's a real lesson to be learned from, you know, what happened during that period and how we can how we can change it here. The um, the idea of this that there isn't vaccine production capacity is another one that's trotted out. Uh, it's not the case. Um, Knowledge Economy, Ecology International has identified at least 144 manufacturing facilities in 35 countries who could be used to manufacture vaccines. They're ready and they're willing. All they need is the, the IP and the intellectual know-how to do it. The other one is, a, which I find very offensive, the Global South doesn't have the capacity or know-how to produce more vaccines. Our own Tanish de Leo Varadkar has, has used that particular line. Very few countries in the global south have the infrastructure know-how or the materials to make those vaccines. And there's no point in giving somebody a recipe if they don't have the kitchen or the cooking skills or the ingredients. To be honest, you know, that, that smacks of kind of racism as well as everything else, if I may be provocative. Um, you know, India is, is one of the leading producers of, of pharmaceuticals for the entire world. It's known as the pharmacy to the world. And there are plenty of already uh, uh, vaccines for for COVID that are being produced in both India and South Africa, so it's it's already happening. Uh, and as I say, the you know we know that that the capacities are there. And again, the the Covax question that I mentioned, it just it, it's it's a it's a step in the right direction. It's it's important that we share whatever surplus vaccines we have. Of course, we should. But the answer to the the global crisis we have is ratcheting up production to a mass scale to be able to vaccine vaccinate. The world population in the next year it's it's doable it's possible as long as the political will is there ireland has rightly so a very laudable reputation on the international stage for global solidarity on so many issues we're playing an, a very important role at the un security council and we've done it in so many other spaces it just doesn't make sense to me why ireland would would hold this position which is completely contrary to the values of the country and most of us here Jim, thanks very much for, for those initial uh, very strong remarks, I think. And I think um, you've given everybody who's listening in a, a good bit of food for thought there. Um, Manon, if we could come back to you just on on questions now. We're now into the Q&A. And uh, just a reminder, we, we are fully on the record for the entire session, both the, the initial presentations there and the Q&A. Um, so so just, just you, you mentioned you have a million and one things you want to say on this topic. Uh, the vote did take place in the European Parliament and it was successful. So the European Parliament has come out strongly uh, calling for, for the TRIPS waiver. Um, obviously, we had the, the U-turn by the Biden administration as well. And yes, the European Council continues to hold its position and the member state governments continue to hold their positions. How, do you, how, how likely is it that you, know, you will force a change there or do you think they will stick to the position? Very interested to hear thoughts on that, Manon. Well, um, first, a word on, uh, on the vote in the European Parliament. As I said, um, when we started to find the European Parliament, we were the only group. So as you, as you might know, unfortunately, our group is far from having the majority in the European Parliament. Um, but we started a campaign and we started uh, pushing all of the other members and all of the other groups 
we tabled quite a few amendments on the issue. And what's interesting is like from the very first time we tabled the amendment to the very last time, you can really see uh, uh, from, from one time to another, how positions evolve and how we're getting more and more members on board as we are going, which is a good news that, you know, this issue got some traction and I, I guess the, the, the influence and, and the pressure kind of uh, started working. Um, the, the, the pressure also coming from civil society like Oxfam and other organization from people. Uh, and that's rather, rather good news. Uh, although when I do remember at the beginning, I, I wish, you know, uh, 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 they would all support it from the beginning because we've been losing so much time and Jim has been mentioning it because, you know, one of the arguments that have been used is, um, well, now if we do it, it's going to take a year before um, some other pharmaceutical companies can really produce and practice some vaccines. Well, the first half probably we would still need a year. And second of all, why, well, it's actually your responsibility that this uh, hasn't been started a year ago when we brought the issue on the table. Now there's a clear position from the European Parliament a year later, but better than, than, than not any position at all. Uh, and, and, and the issue is definitely now in the hands of the council that on this issue, like on many others, uh, has has the habit, I would say, not not to follow and not to respect uh, the position of the European Parliament. So now we're trying to put as much pressure as possible um, on on the European Council and on the European Commission for them to follow our our position that is crystal clear, and uh, and that you know there's. There's no need to turn around, uh, I would say. We, we, all, we, we exactly know what we want, which is a trip waiver as soon as possible. And France and other countries, they've, they've played a weird role because they've been saying one thing publicly and doing another thing in the negotiation. So that's why we need to keep up the pressure to make sure they do deliver, to make sure they follow um, uh, the, the, the vote from the European Parliament that is the only democratic, um, the, the only legitimate um, uh, setting and framework at the European level to express the view of the European citizens. So that's why we need to keep up the pressure. It's great that you're organizing uh, this, this seminar. We need um, uh, to keep up the pressure together with the, the Andrews to make sure that this is a this is translated into into practice and there's a decision that is taken at the the world trade organization brilliant uh, thank you very much Manon, for that response um a couple of questions coming in here now from 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 viewers watching in um, a question uh from my colleague claudia quain who has who's managed a lot of our events um, on, on, on the global health situation over the last couple of months. Um, she, she's a question here on the upcoming WHO special session, which is due to discuss the new international treaty on pandemics in November. Um, what, in your view, should these negotiations include and how could more equitable access to uh, medical solutions and vaccines be, be factored into that, those discussions? Uh, Jim, I'll start with you on that, on that particular answer. Um, I, I wouldn't be fully over, uh, you know, aware of all the, the minutiae of, of those kind of discussions, to be perfectly honest, um, Claudia, but, the, but what I would say is, you know, if we're talking about future pandemics or we're talking about the current one, um, clearly we need to set uh, fair rules of the game here um, and we need to do it now, if it's, even if it's for something that we're, you know, that, that's coming in the future. We shouldn't, you know, I mean, it, as I said at the start, it's extraordinary how quickly um, these the scientific community were able to produce vaccines. You know, in 10, 15, 20, whatever number of years time, if we're faced with something else, we need to make sure that at the start, we're not having this debate. You know, that, you know, vaccines are produced, they're scaled up, they're, you know, whatever way the, the, the burden share of the development is distributed between pharma and between public money or whatever, that, that some arrangements are made or put in place but then that there's no doubting that it's a public good it is scaled up and it is distributed fairly and globally at that time 
and I think that that has to form a foundation for for future thinking on on pandemic approach. Yeah, um, man, and just a question here. I suppose this is possibly aimed more at as an Irish audience, and, and Jim, you might come in, but it'd be interested to get your perspective on it as well, man. And um, it's a question from a, a, a journalist with the Sunday Business Post who is watching in, uh, Sarah Taft McGuire, and she says Ireland has has outlined its plans to start vaccinating twelve to eighteen year olds from September onwards. Um, should it begin at process or should it instead be looking to share its vaccines more widely and globally uh, come to you first man and, and then Jim interest to get your view on that as well well you see that's exactly the problem that we're having at the moment is vaccinating one over others and and the objective is precisely to get out of those questions and I don't want to, to have to choose between you know the, the, the Irish teenagers and and some, I don't know, uh, adults in, in Congo or in Zimbabwe or in India. And um, so, so, of course, I mean, if I'm not a scient uh, scientist, obviously, but if, if, if we listen to them, they're saying that we probably uh, should be vaccinating uh, youth be below 18. A lot of EU countries are already starting to, uh, to do it. Um, this is the case in France, for example. So we know we might have to go through that phase. But again, we, we don't have enough, enough vaccines to do it uh, uh, everywhere in the world because then we, we, we have our capacities that are limited. So that's why the number one priority should be to increase, uh, increase the, the, the capacity. Then in the meantime, um, I would say that it would be up to scientists to, to decide whether, whether you know, we should be vaccinating one over the others. But what I'm afraid of is that in that race that we're having at the moment, it's always the richest countries that win it. It, just as, it, it, it is as simple as that, just because they have the money. We've seen it, for example, um, and it was quite striking for Israel. Uh, the reason why Israel managed to uh, vaccinate uh, almost all of its population in a very short period of time is just because they paid more money. And, and you know, the, the only result of that race is that it, it does increase the profit of pharma companies, but it doesn't save lives. And it doesn't take us for good out of this crazy moment and out of this virus. So again, the only solution is to increase the capacity of production. And Jim, specifically to you, just on that, I mean, I know it's a specific Irish case. Um, you know, Sarah mentions that, you know, there are plans to, to go for children and teenagers aged 12 to 18. Um, you know, is that the, the, the sort of the step we should be taking at this point or should we, should we be looking to distribute those vaccines we have? Yeah, I have to agree with Matt on this. We, we can't, uh... We can't allow this to become some kind of a, a guilt laden kind of scenario where, you know, I think you, you were good enough to mention at the start of this, Dara, that you you got yours. Uh, I've been vaccinated. I'm, I'm touch wood. I'm reason I'm healthy and I'm well, I, I, I could survive, uh, you know, without the disease for quite a long time. You know, it, it can't be that kind of um, artificial zero sum sort of approach. Uh, really, uh, you know, we just, you know, just remembering that, and, and it's back to the, the the old banter about nobody's safe until everybody's safe, and you know that's been trotted out, and we have to live that. You know, everybody needs to be safe, and the only way for everybody to be safe is for everybody to be vaccinated, and it should be done as as fast as is humanly possible. And the solution is staring us in the face. Just uh, by the way, I mean, we we Oxfam Ireland undertook a, a survey of of the Irish public um, in March. And 62% want the the government to support the ending of monopolies and vaccine production, and to and to support the the waiver and the transfer of technology. So, you know, and that's from people who you know were in the queue, presumably for the vaccine. So, you know, you know, there's a very strong public support for this. It makes it makes sense from a human point of view. It's a fair and just thing to do, and it's also a, a very practical thing to do. Yeah. Um... And I'm, Jim, I'll just come to you again with this question as one of my own questions. I mean, you mentioned in your remarks and you were, you're, you know, you're very striking and strong about Ireland's record 
um, you know, on development, on human rights, you know, the fact that we, we do now have a seat at the top table at the UN Security Council and that maybe our voice carries a bit more weight now and you've been quite disappointed with the approach our government has taken uh, to the TRIPS waiver. Um, can, can, you, can you just explain to us maybe if, if there is any hope, is there any chance that, you know, Ireland will maybe move on this and, 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 and can speak to its European colleagues to, to, to try and change the European position? Or, or do, you think, do you think that they will stick with the, the idea of, of, incre of increasing production here and exporting? Well, I mean, certainly um, over the last few months, there, you know, there's, there's a very strong support across a lot of opposition for this. And we've heard government voices too, who have outlined their own support, or, or at least their, their sense that this is the right thing to do, uh, albeit, you know, complex and and you know, with you know, re requiring requiring work. So you know, since that time, unfortunately, the, the government's position has seems to have closed uh, uh, and withdrawn a bit, and 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 is very much now aligned. As I say, there were some uh, senior members in, in government who who had a more open minded approach to it. So you know, and what's disappointing from our point of view is that the the, the counter arguments that we're hearing from the pharmaceutical companies which I, I could go through them. In fact, I, I wrote an article in the Irish Examiner not that long ago, listing every single one of them and explaining why they're, why they're spurious. But a lot of those arguments are, are, are being used by government sources as well. So clearly, you know, there's something going on. And, um, you know, I, I, you know I, as I say, it, it is quite shocking considering, you know, the deserved reputation Ireland has. And Ireland has worked hard for that reputation. It's been, it's been challenging. And in, even in our worst of times here, we were willing to reach out and willing to engage and willing to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves and particularly supporting those who are more vulnerable than we are here. So, you know, it's, it certainly speaks in my view to the values of the Irish people and what should be the values of our, of our international approach. And um, so it does need to change. And, you know, we're just hoping that if people can continue to engage with their, their politicians, their local politicians and so on, and, TDs to to discuss this and to try and encourage movement. Certainly, we're, we're last week we launched the Irish People's uh, People's Vaccine Alliance, and we had a number of international speakers, including uh, Mike Ryan, who everybody knows, and we had Winnie Pianima, who's a former colleague of mine from Oxfam, but she's the executive director of UN AIDS. We have Mustaqueen de Gama, who was the South African permanent mission to the WTO, uh, and and a number of others, and every everybody on that advocating for this TRIPS waiver. And this is part of a global movement. So it's not, you know, there's, there's a whole range of Irish medical professionals, health professionals here, uh, academics, activists, trade unions, and NGOs, but there are lots of others too. And similarly across the world, we have a number of other similar, uh, you know, similar movements. So there is a, a groundswell of, of support for this. Uh, it, it appears, as I say, the, the public themselves have, have told us only only 18% of the public in Ireland are against it. So a, a very large majority are in favor. So we need we need to to nudge the, the politicians to, to come in line with this. And and Ireland can be such a, a credible and influential voice at a European Union level if it supports something like this. I mean we 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 tend to you know be in spaces where we we don't have an axe to grind, we don't have an ulterior motive or another agenda. Uh, and we're, we're, we're very credible in those spaces and we need Ireland to be to, to support this and to be credible in that space. Thanks so much, Jim. Manon, if I just come to you, a specific question and, and apologies if it's, if it's too specific for you, but um, there was reports in the Irish media about um, surplus vaccines in Romania and that, that the, due to vaccine hesitancy, there was so many vaccines being left over in Romania and Ireland was purchasing an extra one million doses from Romania a fellow European colleague. Um, do, do you have concerns about countries in Europe selling vaccines to each other like that when there's such a global demand and global need? And is it, is it, is it morally acceptable that countries in Europe are selling surplus vaccines to each other? Should they not be going into the COVAX pot and, and, and spread more widely? Well, this is precisely the problem of making vaccine like just, just like treating it like any commodity. A vaccine is not a phone. Uh, it's not something that you sell to each other that you can make profit on, um, that you can have a, 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 a patent on it. This is very much different. 
And if, if, if the vaccine is a very, you know, um, very disputed um, uh, item, and it's only ruled by the market, well, then those things happen, the price increase, and then, and then um, states might try to steal each other or to bury each other. And then you, you just, you know, if, if you don't regulate it, then just the market regulates it. And we know what the rules of the market are. It's just like, if it's rare, if it's hard to access, well, the price increases, and then you have all of those practices that you, you've been uh, describing. So it's, it's a clear area of concern. And that's why I think we should not be treating a vaccine like any other community. It's certainly not a, an iPhone or anything else, because the, the, the big difference, obviously, is that it's the only way out of the crisis that we know, and it does save lives. Anything to add on, on that, Jim, or, or would you echo what, what we managed to said? I would, and I, I look, at, you know, there's a real worry, and, and it's not just uh, unique to Romania and Ireland. Uh, we've seen it elsewhere, where um, surplus vaccination uh, capacity and, and availability has been used as a kind of a political lever. Um, I, think, I think Israel also uh, was, you know, was sharing... Um, surplus surplus vaccines with countries that you know and uh, for for various kind of political reasons and th that's that's unacceptable that's that's a you know it's exactly against everything that the the medical profession and those who develop these would you know would would believe in so um it, it can't be it has to be uh, based on a people's good. I mean, I'm not wouldn't be criticizing Ireland in lots of ways because I mean they they saw an opportunity but but that said, I mean there's you know, we we have to we have to ensure that this is not commoditized. I mean, if we commoditize all of our healthcare, then you know where where are we left? Where, where are we left as society? Where are we all left as individuals uh, when we're not so healthy, or where when we're struggling? And whether and that applies across the world, you know. So um, it, it is you know we we can't we can't allow those kind of things to to persist. I'm just turning to you again, um, just on specifically on France. Um, I think I think we all seen the, the reports in the media of of, of President Macron uh, making his announcements around mandatory vaccines for for certain frontline workers, and uh, there was a spike in people in people signing up to get the vaccine. Uh, I know it's off topic slightly, but just just giving giving your own uh, background as a French MEP, just be interested to get your perspective on that. Is that something you think is necessary? Um, or, or what are your own thoughts? I think it's it's always the same problem with my conscience. I mean, I, I was about to say since the beginning of the pandemic, but I, it's actually more generally with with, with the way um, is 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 just doing his policies uh, in France is that the only tool that he has is just like binding. It's like coercion. It's like forcing people. And I think it would be much more efficient to actually ensure that every single person in every single rural or, or, or in, the, in the forest areas everywhere, that every single person has been offered a vaccine. Because currently, and I don't know how it works at the moment in Ireland, but in France to get vaccinated, you have to register yourself online. You have to find, to manage to find a, uh, a timing, a, su a suitable timing, etc. But I think we should turn it around and we should actually proactively go to people and offer them a, a vaccine. Uh, and this is the best strategy while well, we are going to be on holidays for the next couple of weeks. Well, just go to the beach, go to the beach, have some sort of vaccine caravans and go proactively to people rather than forcing them. And I think that logic is not a good logic because it would further divide our society in a time where probably you know, our society has never been so divided, uh, and, and I, in particular in France. And I think this, this, this logic of you know, always forcing, always reducing liberties because uh, you know, if you're not vaccinated, you won't be uh, able to access, to, to go to a bar, a restaurant, to go to the cinema. <clears throat> I mean, one could, could start thinking about it. Um, but 
it's certainly not in two weeks, by the way, because in two weeks, uh, even if you want to get vaccinated now, you won't have your two injections in the next two weeks. But even even so, I think this is not the, 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 the right way to approach it. And this is not the right way to convince uh, those who have doubts. They would just feel their forest, but clearly you won't have, you know, their doubts go away this way. So much uh, for that uh, response, man. I just just wanted to, to put that query to you, given given we have you on. And um, I suppose we'll finish up with this last question, just to, to each speaker. And um, you've both touched on sort of you know the vaccine race and the commodification, uh, etc. I mean, Jim, start with you. Sort of you know what lessons has COVID nineteen taught us? It's a big question to finish, but if you can try and be as concise as possible, what lessons has COVID nineteen taught us about? a general approach to healthcare. I know in Ireland it's quite specific, but, but just more broadly in how maybe we've taken things for granted and, and, and what changes do you think can be made sort of in the, in the short term? I know my colleague Claude mentioned the WHO convention, maybe that might have a bit of progress there. What lessons do you think COVID has taught us about our approach to healthcare and our taking advantage of it? Well, I suppose let's start with the positive. Um, it shows that we can mobilise and we can mobilise very quickly and we can mobilise as a world in lots of ways you know i know there in lots of ways we're not but in lots of ways we are um and we can focus on one big issue that affects us all um to to a level to a level let's say and the what it has also shown us is that it it has exacerbated existing health inequalities that exist even in countries in a country like ireland where you have a two-tier system or across the world where you have very weak uh, health systems in many countries uh, it has, I suppose, ensured that we don't take our health systems for granted, uh, that we we now, and we're seeing it in Ireland, there's, going, there's promises of much deeper investment in healthcare, uh, and that's required in every country in the world, public accessible healthcare. Um, and I think that, you know, if anything good comes out of this, it will be that I think we all appreciate that much more and in, in a much deeper way than we ever did. And hopefully we learn the lessons about um, ongoing investment, irrespective of you know whatever political system may, may be in in place at the time, they, our global health systems, our national health systems require ongoing investment and commitment. They need to be valued by all of us uh, and appreciated by all of us, and we need to to make sure that um, you know that that investment is is ongoing, is deep, and and is is a huge part of of our of our overall kind of economic structure. And then finally, I suppose, just to, to identify, you know, where this has gone horribly wrong and what can we learn from it? I mean, this gross inequality that we're now seeing is, is a horrible manifestation of a, a world that's unequal. Uh, we also saw during the pandemic, you know, sky high rates of violence against women, gender-based violence, you know, something is wrong in society that we need to, to look at. And we've seen many other ways where, um, you know, people who are caregivers have have been you know their own workload has dramatically increased over this past period and we we don't we don't appreciate that work sufficiently in our society we need to change that and um, and then we need to remember that you know that the people that we rely on for our day-to-day -day existence are often people that are on the lower end of the economic scale and that needs to be appreciated and valued in a different way to the way it is today very much, Jim. Um, a big question and, and a lot of lot of lot of food for thought in, in the response there. Man, if I can come to you again. Um, I know I don't mean to talk about the pandemic like it's over because we, we you know, we, as we've just discussed, it's, it's very much not over. But um, what has the pandemic exposed about our way of life? And and, and, and from a European perspective, from a European Parliament perspective, um, how how do you see uh, Europe taking on the issue of public health in the future? Uh, I and mean, we'll finish on that one. Thanks very much, Mana. Well, thanks very much. I agree very, very much with, with, with Jim that, um, you know, what, the reason why this issue of vaccine is so important is just, it's, it's, it's because it's not only uh, the, the issue of, of COVID for now, it's, it's, it's a breach that we want to have in ensuring that we don't treat health as, as any other commodity, uh, that, um, that we are not, you know, um, we are not uh, making it just as, um, yeah, like anything else. 
and that we ensure that we put in place sufficient protect, sufficient protection sorry um to 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 guarantee that the vaccine today but the next generation of vaccines on anything else the treatment on hiv and anything else actually is um you know uh, or are becoming public goods are protected by the state are protected from a big pharma um big, big pharma monopoly that actually at the moment, um, you know, are the ones that have millions of lives of people into their hands. So that should be a big lesson learned from this crisis that I do hope that all of the work that we're all doing together to protect um, the, the health from uh, the market will um, be fruitful and will hopefully help um, in, in the next couple of, of years. But I would go further than that. And I would say that um, there's so many lessons to, to, to be taken from this crisis. We've also seen how, how weak we are when, you know, in the midst of the crisis last year, inside the European Union, we were not able to produce face masks. We're talking here about a piece of paper that we were not able to provide for, for health workers, first and foremost, but also for all of the population. And I don't know how it was in Ireland, but in France, they ended up just lying, saying, well, it was not necessary. It was not necessary just because they don't have the capacity to produce enough of them. And they didn't have the capacity to produce enough of them because we've been selling over our industries and we, we've been killing our industries over, over globalization. And the result is that we were depending on China to produce those face masks. So, you know, drawing some lesson learned from, from, um, from the crisis, I do hope that it will make us more resilient, question our way of production as well to ensure we have the capacities to be resilient in front of this kind of crisis and we don't repeat the same mistakes in, in the near future mistakes on you know sorry for, for the bad light uh, mistakes um mistakes uh, on on the production of vaccines but also mistakes on ensuring we have everything we need to protect our people starting from face masks up to uh, the, the vaccines or anything else we might be needed brilliant uh Manon, thank you very much for for that impassioned response at the end there it's, it's really really heartening to to know that you're you're in the European Parliament and you're 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 advocating uh, for such a, an approach um, to public health, um, we'll finish there. Um, really, really appreciate your time, both of you this, e uh, this evening, this afternoon, Jim and Manon. Um, I will just say to to, to the rest of the, the the attendees watching in, we do have another YPN session uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday we have Mary Black, uh, who's a Scottish National Party MP. Um, she became an MP at the age of 20 in 2015 and uh, she'll be joining us next week to talk about Scotland's future post-Brexit um, but yeah we'll leave it there and thank you very much again Manon and Jim for your time and uh, there's loads more to discuss on this issue and I'm sure we're going to be covering it in, in more detail at the Institute so thanks again.